It's a, a pleasure to uh, be here and have a chance to talk to you about some of the work that I and my colleagues and research assistants have been doing in the area of memory and memory distortion. Can you, can you hear me all right? Okay. And uh, just to show you that um, sometimes people can um, create false memories uh, or create entire memories that don't involve a penis and a vagina but can still get people in trouble. I'll tell you about the case of Klaus von Bülow. Uh, von Bülow, as many of you know, was accused of injecting his wife with insulin and putting her into a coma where she remains today in a hospital in New York City. And one of the interesting things about the von Bülow trial, the first trial, was the testimony that came from the Von Bulow maid. It was the maid Maria who said that when she went into the closet and she found this black bag and she opened up the bag, she saw a bottle inside and the bottle said insulin on it and she said, I remembered it clearly because I'd never seen insulin before. Well, Von Bülow's uh, convicted. He retains Alan Dershowitz, professor of law at Harvard, to work on his appeal. And one of the things that Dershowitz puzzled over was this testimony from Maria the maid. Why was Maria so confident, so positive, that she had seen this bottle with insulin on it? After all, when she went into the closet and found the bag, nothing of significance had happened. In fact, Sonny Von Bülow wouldn't collapse for many more months. Well, Dershowitz dug around for an answer to this puzzle, and he found the answer in the notes that were taken of an interview that Maria had given very early on. In Maria's initial interview, yes, she said she went in the closet, she found the black bag, she opened it up, and inside there was a bottle, but she originally said that she had no idea what was in the bottle because the label was all scraped off. So how is it that somebody can go then from seeing a label all scraped off to now months and months later having a clear image, a memory of a label that says insulin and embellishing that memory with all this extra information about how I remember it because I'd never seen insulin before. I think that the work that I and other cognitive psychologists have been doing in the area of memory and memory distortion can help us understand situations like this one, the development of a memory, a memory for a label, or even a memory for something very, very complex. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of that research. And I'm looking forward to presenting here, particularly for my fellow cognitive psychologists, some new data uh, showing how some of the techniques that may be used in some therapy sessions might be uh, leading people to false memories. I mean, we know that's true, but just the scientific documentation of, of some of the dangers of those techniques is what I will show you in a few minutes. Well, uh, I, just by way of background, the kind of experiments that I and others have been doing on memory distortion usually involve a simple procedure uh, what happens in these experiments is you take two groups of people, you allow them to see some sort of event, uh, maybe it's a simulated crime, a simulated accident, later on you're going to test these people, but for half of the people you try to feed them some misinformation, some erroneous information, and then you can look at the impact of this erroneous information on memory by comparing these two groups of individuals. And so here's some, uh, 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 just one example of this kind of a study. Uh, in the barn experiment that we did many years ago, we showed people a simulated accident. It occurs on a country road. There's no barn anywhere. Uh, for half of our witnesses, we expose people to some misinformation. In fact, we suggest to them that they saw a barn when they didn't. We accomplished that suggestion by a leading question. How fast was the white sports car going when it passed the barn while traveling along the country road? And notice how that question falsely presupposes the existence of a barn. When we bring people back a week later in this particular study and ask them, oh, by the way, did you see a barn? 
If we had earlier suggested that there was one, 17% in this particular study said, yes, I saw that barn. Now, they could have said, I don't know or I don't remember, but nearly a fifth of them were willing to say, I saw that barn. So we suggested at this time that by simply mentioning in a suggestive way objects, even large objects that never existed, you can add these objects to people's recollections. Our work shows that you can do more than just add objects to people's recollections. You can actually alter people's recollections for what they've seen. We demonstrated this in a series of studies, for example, in which we show people a simulated accident. And there's a, a scene in the middle where a car goes through an intersection. And let's just say there's a yield sign controlling that intersection. Later on, we're going to ask people, what kind of a traffic sign did you see controlling the intersection? But half of our witnesses, the misled group, they'll be fed the information that it was the opposite sign, the stop sign in this example. So just to take you through the sequence of somebody who was fed suggestive misinformation, we show them the scene with the, uh, the, the, the accident unfolding, a car comes to the intersection, there's a yield sign there. Later on, we're going to ask some questions, including one that suggests to them it was a stop sign. Did another car pass the red dots and while it was stopped at the stop sign? Later on, we can come back and say, uh, what kind of a traffic sign do you, did, did you see? Or we can even give people a two alternative forced choice recognition test where the scene that corresponds to the truth, in this example, the one on the left, is next to the scene that corresponds to the suggestive information in this case, the one on the right, and under certain circumstances, we'll find over 80% of our individuals claiming they saw the stop sign, even though the truth is staring them in the face, they don't recognize it anymore. Why? I believe it's because we've altered their recollections of what they've seen before. Well, we've now done hundreds of studies involving well over 20,000 individuals in which we've deliberately tried to distort people's memories and we study the process of distortion. Just one more example from that earlier line of work. We showed people a, a simulated crime. This uh, vehicle plays a critical role, this pickup truck. We're going to try to suggest to people that it wasn't a pickup truck, but it was something like a small car. We accomplished the suggestion by asking a leading question. At the very end of the sequence, when the victim and her friends were standing by the parked car, were any of the women pointing? Now you think this uh, is a question about, gee, were women pointing? And while I'm asking you that question and you're trying to think about your answer, we slip in the information that it was a car, not a pickup. It invades people, I believe, something like a Trojan horse, because they don't even detect that it's coming. Well, now we come back to people, tell us a little bit about that vehicle that you saw, that critical vehicle. And if they can't describe it, we help them out with a vehicle identification test. And what we find in this particular study is that people will, the interesting responses, I think, are people will sometimes compromise. They compromise between what they saw themselves, namely the pickup, and what we suggested to them after the fact, namely that it was a car. And so we'll find as a form of mental compromise, some people will tell us they saw a station wagon. It's kind of an interesting trick of the mind. When we say, tell us a little more about it, here are some verbatim responses. One subject says the car station wagon, I think. And another subject, metallic light green station wagon. Well, I've now summed up probably 15 years of research that's been done in my laboratory on what's now called the misinformation effect. This is the simplest depiction of that effect. And all we're saying here, and all I'm trying to show you, is that if you feed people misinformation about the past, then you're going to affect, in a negative way, their memory performance. Not all the time, but often enough. And, and when people are uh, absorbing this mis misinformation, when they're uh, incorporating this misinformation, they will sometimes be very confident about their recollections. In fact, when we measure confidence ratings, we'll find that after people have been fed misinformation and incorporated it, they're quite confident. They're often quite confident about what they've seen. 
If you plot confidence, this is for the cognitive psychologists uh, using calibration curves, uh, what we find is that when you feed people misinformation, you completely disrupt the relationship between confidence and accuracy. For everybody here, in a, in a more lay terms, one of the things that I'm showing you here is that when we took people who were 100% sure of their memory, they were, but they had been fed misinformation, they were correct about half the time. We have even found, and here's some data from one of my uh, uh, graduate students, Kelly Tolan's master's thesis, that if you want to know, gee, do people really believe in these false memories that we're suggesting? Uh, Kelly's idea was, let's find out if they'd be willing to bet money on these memories, just as a means of, of sorting out, is it something they're just saying, or do they really feel it in here? And her data show us that about half the time, people were willing to bet the maximum amount they possibly could on those misinformation memories. So back then to the misinformation effect. The question I now want to ask is this one, particularly for us who, who are concerned with some of the very elaborate, entirely detailed memories that we're seeing in some of these false memory situations, could suggestion lead people not just to change a detail or two in their memory, but could you actually get people to have an entire memory for something that didn't happen, particularly something that didn't happen to them in childhood? And I want to just show you some relatively new data um, that demonstrate that, yes, even with this kind of suggestion and suggestive influences, you can get people to have entirely false memories. In one study, uh, and the chief research assistant in this case is Michelle Nucci, we suggested to people who had actually seen a bank robbery, a simulated bank robbery and a simulated warehouse break-in and a few other events, that they had also seen a drug bust. We suggested this through a series of leading questions. And later on, when we said to people, you know, did you, did you see this drug bust? And can you tell us a little bit about it? We found that about 64% of the time, people would start to tell us about this drug bust. We had only suggested to them an entire event that never actually happened. Now, when they tell us about this drug bust, one of the things, you know, you might say, well, what's in their memory of a drug bust? What's in their memory? And one of the things we find is that they sometimes import information, in fact, about three quarters of the time, they import information from other scenes or scenarios that they actually have experienced. But sometimes they make up entirely new details, like, yes, I remember seeing uh, somebody flush drugs, what looked down the sink or down the toilet. Now, in addition to showing that we can get people to remember from two weeks ago an entire event that never actually happened, we've also been looking at whether you can get people to have entirely false childhood memories. The particular paradigm that we use is to try to get people to believe that when they were about five years old, they were lost in a shopping mall that they were lost for an extended period of time, that they were frightened, that they were crying, and that they were ultimately rescued by an elderly person. <coughs> we accomplished this suggestion by bringing in a family member, an older sibling or a parent of our subject. And so here is one of our first uh, test cases. You see 14-year-old Chris and his older brother Jim, and Jim, a student at the University of Washington constructed, with our help, four memories of things that would have happened to Chris when he was five. The only problem is one of those, three of them were true memories, and one of them was the false memory about getting lost. The false memory was suggested to Chris in a paragraph. And the paragraph in Chris's case was, it was 1981 or 82, I remember Chris was five, we'd gone shopping at the University City shopping mall in Spokane, I was 12, the older brother. Somehow we'd lost Chris, 
Then there's some panic. We find Chris. He's being led down the mall by a tall, oldish man. I think he was wearing a flannel shirt. Chris was crying and holding the man's hand. The man explained he'd found Chris walking around crying his eyes out just a few moments before and was trying to help him find his parents. Now, Chris wrote about this particular incident every day, and, and when you read his verbatim responses, you can see that over the course of these few days, he starts to remember his thoughts at the time. He starts to remember that he was really scared, scared he'd never see his family again, knowing he was in trouble. He started to remember conversations with his mother when she finally found him again, that she said, don't ever do that again. Uh, she, he began to remember a little bit more about the man's flannel shirt and so on. You might be saying to yourself, well, wait a minute. You know, how do we know that Chris isn't just trying to go along with his older relative to help him out, that maybe he doesn't really remember? But we instructed Chris and others, if you can't remember, just say, I can't remember. And Chris proved that he was willing to follow this instruction because for one of his true memories, he said, I can't remember, and the next day he said, I still can't remember, I still can't remember, and so on. Two weeks later, we brought Chris back. We asked him to tell us a little bit more about what he remembered, and by now he had greatly elaborated on this false memory of being lost. He had a whole vision of the man who supposedly rescued him, the balding head, the glasses, and so on. And he continued to remember how frightened and scared he had supposedly been at the time. About six months later, I brought Chris back to the lab. I just wanted to be sure there were you know, no uh, long-term effects of, of having been through this kind of procedure. Uh, and we interviewed Chris and talked to him about it. I said, well, how do you feel now uh, about having gone through this experiment? And Chris said to us, you know, he really thought this was a great experience. In fact, he had so much fun, he's tried it out a few times on some of his friends. <laughs> I mean, uh, well, not, not too long uh, ago, a, a documentary producer, Elaine Purchase, making a documentary about the false memory syndrome problem, called me and said she'd really like to interview Chris, because Chris had been written about in The New Yorker and written about in Newsweek and so on. And, and uh, I said, well, you know, Chris has been debriefed. He knows, that, he knows now that his memory is false. I'm not quite sure, um, you know, what you're going to find. She said, well, we just would like to talk to him. And I thought you might like to meet Chris. So I have a little bit of video uh, from Elaine's documentary uh, where she talks to Chris now about what his uh, experience was like. And I'll just show you this before I present you with the formal data from this particular experiment. So could we have the video, please? That if you show people a scene like this and later ask, how fast was the green car going? Many of them will remember a green car. But could you get someone to remember an event that never happened? Well, I remember um, being lost in the mall, and then I remember like an old man asking me if I was lost, and I remember what he was wearing, like his red flannel shirt and his glasses, and he was kind of balding and stuff. And I told him I was lost and that I was crying, and um, I remember him holding my hand and walking around. I remember walking by certain stores in the mall. And I remember seeing my mom and her yelling at me and telling me never to do it again. <laughs> Chris Cohen vividly remembers being lost in a shopping mall when he was a little boy. There's only one hitch. It never happened. It was, it was a little bit difficult for me to tell him uh, after the, the, his, his testimony that um, I made it up. I made the story up. Do you remember even the stack of wood? That big Chris and his brother Jim were part of an experiment on suggestion and childhood memory. Jim, a graduate student in psychology, wrote several short descriptions of things that had happened in the family years ago. He asked Chris, his mother, and his sister to write down what they could remember about each event. Then go back to it each day for six days and write down anything more they remembered. All of the events were true, except the story about Chris getting lost in the shopping mall. It seemed like it had really happened. It really seemed real. It still seems like it really happened. That, says Loftus, is the disturbing thing about false memories. Okay, you can't the tell them Absolutely from the real thing. Um, 
the uh, particular uh, piece of research that essentially uses this basic paradigm uh, involves now subjects who range in age from 18 to uh, 53 years old. Um, I want to show you uh, what, what happens in this particular uh, formal study is these subjects uh, have three occasions where they try to recall these four memories, three true ones and the one memory about being lost in the shopping mall. And these data show you that, first of all, for the true memories, uh, people recall those true memories close to 70% of the time. About 30% of the time, they're failing to recall the things that actually did happen to them when they were about five years old. Over the course of the three sessions, um, about, uh, let's say, 20 to 25% of our subjects are willing to produce either a partial or a complete memory of having been lost in the shopping mall. Uh, one of our subjects, for example, is a Vietnamese woman, and uh, she was 20 years old with the help of her older relative. The false memory of having been lost in the Bremerton Kmart when she was about five years old with her siblings around, ultimately being rescued by an elderly Chinese woman, a woman uh, and after that they went off to get an IC. This uh, subject, Tran, uh, starts to remember uh, this almost, almost uh, immediately, that is in the first session. She says, I vaguely remember walking around Kmart crying and looking for Tian and Tuan. I thought I was lost forever. I went to the shoe department because we always spent a lot of time there. I went to the handkerchief place because we were there last. I circled all over the store, it seems, ten times. I just remember walking around and crying. I do not remember the Chinese woman or the icy, but it would be a raspberry icy if I was getting an icy part. I don't even remember being found. And then she continues to elaborate on this greatly in her subsequent sessions. Well, nicely, when uh, Newsweek wrote about this uh, uh, particular study in uh, September of this year, um, they came up with a model of how the uh, false memory might be implanted. Actually, this Newsweek article was based on a uh, conference on memory distortion and the science of memory distortion that Dan Schachter organized at Harvard. And so really what this article was about is about the science of false memories. How is it that uh, somebody might develop a false memory of having been lost in a shopping mall? Well, you might take bits and pieces of actual experience, your stereotype of being lost, someone else's story of being lost, Hansel and Gretel, who got lost. And you can use this kind of material to combine it and to construct uh, a, an experience that you place in a particular location with particular people there. Uh, and that is part of the reconstructive nature of memory. Now, I get a lot of um, comment about this particular study. I, this study about being lost in the shopping mall is a study that people love to hate. Beca and they, you know, one of the kind of comments I hear is, well, you know, everybody's been lost, even, even if briefly. And of course, my answer to that is, yes, but we've created an entire experience. It happened in a particular location, at a particular age, with particular people present, with particular stores around. And if people use a part of an actual experience and combine it with all this extra information, that's part of the process of memory creation. But there are now other studies that have used this same procedure. One of them by Ira Hyman from Western Washington University, using the same procedure of involving family members to help you construct these potentially false memories. Ira Hyman has convinced his subjects that they had a pain in their ear when they were a kid, that they had to go to a hospital overnight for a suspected ear infection. And about 20 percent or so of his adult subjects will develop that false memory. In another study, Ira Hyman convinced his adult subjects that when they were a kid, they, accident they went to a family wedding, they accidentally knocked into the punch bowl and they spilled punch all over the parents of the bride. So I think we're seeing here now some more and more elaborate false memories being created. And in recently published work that I collaborated on with Steve Cece from Cornell, uh, Maggie Buck, Michelle Leichman, 
we're showing that you can get kids especially and in increasing numbers to remember things like they got their hand caught in a mouse trap and had to go to a hospital to get it removed or in another study that they fell off of a tricycle or a bicycle and had to get stitches in their leg. So what I've shown you so far is that false memories can be created. They can be created for entire events. People can be quite confident and detailed about these false memories. Uh, and it's going to be very, very hard to distinguish between a memory that is genuine and one that is a product of this kind of suggestion. Now, I want to move for a second to a therapy situation. And, uh, I, you know, I and others, um, many in this room, have, uh, have been analyzing what kinds of things go on in some of the therapy sessions that we have concerns about. We've been analyzing the books that therapists write for other therapists where they say things like, here's what I like to do with my clients. And you've seen lots of, of these books. And in many of these books, you will find these techniques that, that Ste Lindsay and Reed have talked about as being uh, risky or potentially dangerous. And one of those techniques, I mean, you, you know, the, some of the things that are being done in the name of therapy, really, uh, as we all know here, you know, just really could blow your mind. But the one that I want to talk about now is this imagistic work that Renee Fredrickson is so fond of. Imagistic work. You don't remember who molested you? Let's just imagine who it might have been. Let's just picture where you might have been, oh, your bedroom, and who might have been coming in, oh, your father, and what would you have been wearing, oh, that little nighty. And before you know it, there's an elaborate imagination. So we've been asking, what is the impact of imagining something that may not have happened? What is the impact on a person's memory? And these are the new data that I'm quite excited about. In collaboration with uh, my postdoc and graduate students, uh, Mary Ann Gary and Chuck Manning, and uh, also with Jim Sherman from Indiana, we've been doing a very simple experiment where we ask people about some things that may have happened to them in the past. That's an LEI, a life experiences inventory. And a couple of weeks later, we try to get them to imagine something elaborate happening to them that never, presumably never really happened. And then we're going to ask them about their own personal life experiences again. So for example, in one of our Oh, turn off the slides, thank you. Earlier. You don't need the last one. You get the basic idea. I mean, this is an imagery experiment here. Now, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to imagine. We hate to do this to you, but it's not too dangerous, I guess. Imagine it's after school. You're playing in the house. You hear a strange noise outside. You run to the window. Um, Let's see, you uh, trip and you fall, and we get people to participate in this imagination exercise by imagining who might have been with them and so on. As you're falling, you reach out to catch yourself, your hand goes through the window, uh, the window breaks, you get cut, there's some blood, keep imagining this, how, how would you have felt at the time and so on. Okay, now, this life experiences inventory, we're just asking people about a whole lot of things that did or did not happen to them when they were children. And of course, one of the items for this particular purpose is, did you break a window with your hand? There are eight critical items in this particular study, and people just have to tell us on a scale from one to eight, where one is anchored, it definitely didn't happen, eight is anchored, it definitely did happen. Tell us how likely it is that this particular kind of thing happened to you when you were a child. Now, if we look just at the items that 
were relatively unlikely to have happened, things that they gave a one through four to initially. And we ask, what is the effect of having imagined this kind of thing happening, of recently imagining a single act of imagination increases the likelihood that people feel that this event happened to them in the past. Actually, even without imaginations, we're getting some increases. But you can see here that people increased their subjective likelihood that these particular events happened in the past. And actually, what these particular data show you are that for each and every one of our eight critical items, imagining that this happened to you increases the likelihood over a no imagination condition that this particular thing happened to you in the past. Now, what, what these data mean to me is that just in imagining something, just imagining something in the past can get you to start thinking. It's that first step in what Offshee and Waters would call that step-by-step -step process that can to send people off onto this path, uh, sort of a royal road to a false memory. Well, you know, I think it's pretty clear that when you engage people in suggestive, suggestive activities, like you ask them leading and suggestive questions, you get them to engage in certain mental exercises, in this case like imagination, you can begin to lead people or take them all the way to having a false memory. These false memories, once they're constructed, can be held with great confidence. They can be elaborate, elaborated upon in great detail. And it's very, very difficult for the person himself or herself to, at that point, be able to distinguish between a genuine experience that truly reflects the past and one that doesn't. I, I'm sure most of you know now that this process is not one that involves deliberate lying. For as, as Ashley Brilliant said, if you don't know what the truth is anymore, how can you tell a lie? I just want to leave you with the one message that um, I guess I've gotten out of uh, a couple of decades of doing research in the area of memory and memory distortion, again from uh, my favorite uh, cartoonist. Uh, some of the things that will live longest in my memory never really happened. Thank you very much for listening.